the way for us. Yes. He has already worked it out. Yes, he has. He has finished it. Yes. But we have to do our part, and we can't see the end from the beginning. We have to trust in the Lord's goodness yes. and his faithfulness. Yes. Amen. And so what's our part, right? It's what Nathan's been teaching us, to speak his word. Yes. To speak his word so that he can bring it to pass. Yes. To wait upon him. Oh, the waiting. Jesus. I don't know about you, but that's my least favorite part. But it'll come yes. if we'll wait. And to trust in him. To not give in to doubt and worry. To let go and let God. We say it every yes. Sunday. To let go and let God. Yes. And I don't know which of those is the hardest. Keeping my mouth shut. Yeah. After I speak the word and then zip it. To not complain, to not say the negative, to not repeat the problems, to not talk about the circumstance, to not ask for prayer and blah, 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 yeah, blah, yeah. set it all out again. Mm -hmm. right. To just say the words that agree yes. with his word. That is, yes. that is not easy when all the stuff is swirling yeah. all around us. Yeah. To put a gate yes. over this mouth. Yes. You know, the, my husband jokes that, you know, I have a lot of words I got to use every day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And if it gets to the end of the day, I'm going to use them one way or the other. You may fall asleep listening, but I'm using my words. But are my words creating life? Yes, or are my words just words, just sound? It's like I hear that clanging symbol, right? Is it just clanging? Is it noise? Yeah, that's so true. To be patient. To wait. Oh, Lord. To know that even if it doesn't happen today, if it doesn't happen tomorrow, if it doesn't happen 10 years from now, Tim talks about Moses and that it's 40 years from now. Yes. Well, we trust and believe him. Yes. Mm -hmm. And when we trust him, well, we just leave it at his feet. I, I joked in our women's group that sometimes our prayers are like a hot potato. We say them, but then we want to take them back. We get burned when we pull them back. Yes. Our worries, we put them at his feet and we feel so much better because we, we prayed and we know that he yes. heard us. Yes. And then we want to go back and pick them back up. Well, Lord... You know, it didn't happen to say, maybe, Ishmael, maybe if I make it my way, maybe if I do this one thing, I'll, I'll help God out. Maybe that's what God wanted me to do. I think I heard God say, no, no, God said, trust me. Right? Trust me. That's it. Oh, to let it go, to not fix it ourselves, to help God out. As much as we want to trust the Lord, we can't see the end from the beginning. We get in those circumstances, and all we can see is what's right in front yeah. of our face. Yeah. Our imaginations. Oh, buddy, do we have vivid imaginations. Yeah. We worry. Yeah. We doubt. We, we think of things that aren't even going to happen. Right. We imagine circumstances that are never going to come to pass. Right. Did the Lord say that? Did I really hear him? Oh, did I sin? Did I do something wrong? Do I not deserve this? Yeah. Is there something that I'm doing? What am I doing to stop this? Yeah. It's not about us. It's not about what we deserve. It's about who he is. Yes. Yes. That is right. yes. And maybe we're strong at first, right? Maybe we're hanging in and we're yes. believing and we're not letting go. But then time passes. Sure. Mm -hmm. And our prayers haven't been answered. Sure. In a way that we recognize they haven't been answered. Right. And when we can't see the way out before the Lord is prepared for us, do we lose heart? Or do we choose to just believe? Now, the good news is that we're not alone in our struggles. Amen. We are not the first followers of Christ to get lost in the chaos of this world and to not understand the plan that was set before us. So I want to start in Mark 14, verses 45 through 50. Mark 14, verses 45 to 50. And as soon as he was come, he goes straight away to him and saith, Master, Master, and he kissed him. This is Judas in the garden. Mm -hmm. And they laid hands on him, on Jesus, and the guards took him. And one of them that stood by drew a sword and smote a servant. One of the disciples drew a sword and took an ear off of one of the servants and cut his ear off. And Jesus answered and said unto them, unto the guards, Are you come out as against a thief, like I'm some criminal with swords and staves to take me? I was with you daily in the temple teaching, and you didn't take me then, but the scripture must be fulfilled. And they all forsook him and fled. Tim talked about that last Sunday, and that stuck out to me. He was talking about how Jesus felt. But I thought about how confused these disciples had to have been. They had given up everything 
They had left their families, they had left everything, their jobs, and they followed yes. this man for three years. Yeah. They knew him. I mean, I just, like, they, they knew him yes. in a way that we will never know him. Yes. And as Tim was talking, how they ran to save their own necks, yeah. they didn't know what was going on. This wasn't part of the plan that they understood. Right. This was their savior. This was their king coming to take his throne. And they're watching him be arrested. Yeah. And then they're watching him be tortured. And then they're watching him be put to death. Yeah. Jesus tried to explain it. He tried to prepare them, but he knew they wouldn't understand. Sure. So he wasn't surprised when they turned tail, cut and run. Yeah. When they ran away and they abandoned him. He wasn't surprised because he knew they wouldn't understand. Right. So what did Jesus say to them right before he went to the garden. Because he had that he had that final moments with his disciples, the people that he knew were yeah. going to carry on his ministry. Yeah. What did he tell them that he thought would prepare them? Because to me that seems like some wisdom that we ought to understand and that we need to get. Right. That's something that he thought was the most important thing for his disciples to know. He was literally telling them that this moment was coming. Yeah. And so, um, let's see, John 16, 31 through 33. John 16, 31 through 33. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? He's tried to tell them this whole thing. John 15, John 16, he was teaching them. And he said, do you now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that you'll be scattered, every man to his own, and you're going to leave me. And yet, I am not alone, because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Yes. That's why we sang that song today. He has overcome by the yes. blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Yes. Yes. Be of good cheer. You're going you're gonna to turn away from me. You're going to not understand and you're going to choose not to believe me in moments. You're going to just not get it. But it's okay. I have overcome the world. These things are going to happen all around you, but it's okay. I have overcome the world. The disciples thought they knew the plan. They thought they understood the road that was before them. But then Jesus died. They watched in horror, you know, as everything that happened. Or from a distance, because they were scared and they were hiding, because they thought, oh my gosh, are we going to die too? They didn't understand the plan. They didn't comprehend what Jesus was really telling them. So let's read about the rest of the teaching that he gave them right before he went to Gethsemane. I'm going to read this actually out of the message. So the most important thing, there's five, six sections. The vine and the branches. You're going to be hated by the world. I'm preparing you so you won't be surprised. And then I'm going to send a comforter, a friend. The Holy Spirit's going to come. And then you're going to know joy like a river. That's what he wanted them to know. So John chapter 15, this is from the message. I am the real vine, and my father is the farmer. He cuts off every branch of me that doesn't bear grapes. Mm -hmm. And every branch that is a grape bearing, he prunes back so it will bear even more. You are already pruned back by the message that I have spoken. Mm -hmm. We're already pruned, folks. Mm -hmm. Our hearts have been circumcised. Mm -hmm. Our hearts of flesh have been circumcised by the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Live in me. Make your home in me just as I do in you. In the same way that a branch can't bear grapes by itself, but only being joined to the vine, you can't bear fruit unless you're joined with me. I am the vine. You are the branches. When you're joined with me and I with you, the relation, intimate and organic, the harvest is sure to be abundant. Separated, you can't produce a thing. Anyone who separates from me is dead wood gathered up and thrown in the bonfire. But if... You will make yourself at home with me, and my words are at home in you. Mm -hmm. You can be sure that whatever you ask will be listened to and acted upon. Yes. This is how my Father shows who he is when you produce grapes, when you mature as my disciples. There's a maturing that happens in the face of death. But we're waiting for the resurrection. We're waiting for the promise. We're waiting for life. There's a maturing that has to happen. That's the process. 
I've loved you the way my Father has loved you. Make yourselves at home in my love. Mm -hmm. If you keep my commandments, you will remain intimately at home in my love. That's what I've done. I've kept my Father's commands and made myself at home in his love. I've told you these things for a purpose, that my joy might be your joy, and your joy wholly mature. This is my command. Love one another the way I have loved you. That's it. They will know you by your love. Right. It tells us over and over, God is love. Yes. If there's no love in you and you don't love one another, then you're not in me. There's not a list of rules. There's not, there's not 10 commandments. There's not 666 laws right. that the Jewish yeah. people have to uphold. Right. There's one law, the law of love. Amen. Love one another the way I have loved you. This is the very best way to love. Put your life on the line for your friends. You are my friends when you do the things I command you. I'm no longer calling you servants because servants don't understand what their master is thinking and planning. No, I've named you friends because I've let you in on everything I've heard from the Father. You didn't choose me, remember. I chose you. He chose every single one of us. He called us by name. We are tattooed on the palms of his hands. He knows every hair on our head. He knew us before we were formed in our mother's bellies. And he has called us. He chose us. And he put you in the world to bear fruit. He put us here to bear fruit for his kingdom. Fruit that won't spoil. As fruit bearers, whatever you ask the Father in relation to me, he gives to you. Mm -hmm. But remember the root command. The root (coughs) command. The root command. Love one another. Hated by the world. Gave him the good news. Now he's going to talk about the reality of the world we live in. If you find that God this world is hating you, remember it got its start hating me. If you lived on the world's terms, the world would love you as one of its own. But since I picked you to live on God's terms and no longer on the world's terms, the world is going to hate you. It's not going to understand. And when that happens, remember this. Servants don't get better treatment than their masters. If they beat on me, they're certainly going to beat on you. And if they did what I told them, they will do what you tell them. They're going to do all these things to you because of the way they treated me. Because they don't know the one who sent me. If I hadn't come and told them all this in plain language, it wouldn't be so bad. As it is, they have no excuse. Hate me, hate my father, it's all the same. If I hadn't done what I have done among them, works no one has ever done, they wouldn't be to blame. But they saw the God signs and hated them anyway, both me and my father. Interesting. They have verified the truth of their own scriptures when it is written, they hated me for no good reason. When the, when the friend I plan to send you from the father comes, the spirit of truth issuing from the father... He will confirm everything about me. You too, from your start, must give your confirming evidence since you are, uh, since you are in this with me from the start. And uh, go on to uh, John 16. I've told you these things to prepare you for rough times ahead. They're going to throw you out of the meeting places. They will even come in times when anyone, uh, there will even come a time when anyone who kills you thinks he's doing God a favor. They will do these things because they never really understood the Father. I've told you these things so that when the time comes and they start in on you, you will be well warned and ready for them. I didn't tell you this earlier because I was with you every day, but now I'm going on my way to the one who sent me. Not one of you has asked, where are you going? Instead, the longer I've talked, the sadder you've become. So let me say it again, this truth. It's better for you that I leave. If I don't leave, the friend won't come. But if I go, I'll send him to you. And when he comes, he'll expose the error of the godless world's view of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He'll show them that their refusal to believe in me is their basic sin. That righteousness comes from above, where I am with the Father, out of their sight and control. And that judgment takes place as the ruler of this godless world is brought to trial and convicted. The only judgment is for Satan. Mm -hmm. I still have many things to tell you, but you can't handle them right now. Mm -hmm. But when the friend comes, the spirit of truth, 
He will take you by the hand and guide you into all the truth that there is. He won't draw attention to himself, but will make sense out of what it is that's about to happen, and indeed, out of all that I have done and said. He will honor me. He will take from me, and he will deliver it to you. Everything the Father has is also mine, and that is why I've said he takes from me, and he delivers to you. And in a day or so, you're not going to see me, but then in another day or so, you will see me. Joy like a river flowing. That stirred up a hornet's nest of questions among the disciples. They didn't understand a word that he was telling them. What is he talking about? In a day or so, you're not going to see me, but then in another day or so, you'll see me again? And because I'm on my way to the Father, what is it this day or so? We don't know what he's talking about. Jesus knew they were dying to ask him what he meant, so he said, are you trying to figure out amongst yourselves what I mean? When I said in a day or so, you're not going to see me, then in another day or so, you will see me? Then fix this firmly in your minds. You're going to be in very deep mourning when the godless world, while the godless world throws a party. Yeah. You'll be very sad, but your sadness will develop into gladness. Mm. When a woman gives birth, she has a hard time. There's no getting around it. But when the baby is born, there is joy in the birth. Yeah. This new life in the world wipes out the memory of the pain. Yeah. And the sadness that you have right now is similar to that pain. But the coming joy is also similar. When I see you again, you'll be full of joy, and it won't be a joy that it'll be a joy that no one can rob from right, you. Right. You'll no longer be so full of questions. This is what I want you to do. I want you to do this. Ask the Father for whatever it is in keeping with the things I've revealed to you. Ask in my name, according to my will, and He'll most certainly give it to you. Your joy will be a river overflowing its banks. I've used figures of speech in telling you these things, and soon I'll drop the figures and tell you about the Father in plain language. Then you can make your request directly to him in relation to this life I've revealed to you. I won't continue making requests of the Father on your behalf. I won't need to, because you've gone out on a limb. You've committed yourselves to love and to trust in me, believing I came directly from the Father. And the Father loves you directly. First, I left the Father and arrived in the world. And now I leave the world and travel to the Father. His disciples said, finally, you're giving it to a straight and plain talk. No more figures of speech. Now we know that you know everything. It all comes together in you. You won't have to put up with our questions anymore. We're convinced you came from God. And Jesus answered them, do you finally believe? In fact, you're about to make a run for it saving your own skins and abandoning me. But I'm not abandoned. The Father is with me. I've told you all this so that trusting me, you will be unshakable and assured deeply at peace. In this godless world, you will continue to experience difficulties. But take heart, I've conquered the world. They didn't understand what he was talking about. They had no idea. They're like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> And right after this, Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, right? And he prayed for strength to follow through with the Father's plan because he saw what was ahead of him. Yeah. To endure the road that led to the cross. I thought it was so important to sing those songs today. Yes. To be reminded of everything that Jesus endured for us. Yes. It is something that every day should be on our hearts and the forefront yes. of our mind. He paid too high a price right. for us to not be thankful for every drop of blood. I was talking to Sarah um, about the Passion of the Christ. And the one scene in the movie that just struck me is after he was um, beaten, he was whipped, and, and Mary, his mother, was out there. She was frantically, every drop of blood on that concrete, she was out there with a rag, just every drop of blood, she was trying to mop it up. Yeah, yeah. And I thought, that is a picture of how precious yes. every drop of his blood is. Yes. She didn't want one of those left for someone to walk on. She was just, that just, that image. We should be desperate to make every drop of blood precious. Yes. And then he prayed for his disciples, right? That they would find their way after he left. Mm -hmm. That they would understand, that they would find a way to get through the morning mm -hmm. and into the ministry that he was leaving for them. Mm -hmm. And then he prayed for us, those that would come 
all of those that have been given to him, those that would find our way to him even though we didn't get to touch his hands. But we would come together as the body of Christ. He prayed for all of us, every yes. single one of us. And then the disciples, after the Garden of Gethsemane, they watched him be arrested. They watched in horror as Jesus was brutally beaten, rejected as the Jews chose Barabbas to save instead yeah. of him. Yeah. And then they hung him on a cross to die. So the big piece of the puzzle the disciples were missing, what did they miss? They didn't understand resurrection. They didn't understand. They understood death. They understood who Jesus was. Yeah. They didn't understand resurrection. They had heard the stories of Elijah and Elisha raising the dead. They even watched Jesus call forth Lazarus from the yes. tomb when he stunk. Yes. But they didn't understand that Jesus is life. Yes. Jesus is the resurrection. Yes. He himself is life. Yes. He descended and he defeated death, hell, yes. and the grave. Yes. Revelation 1.18 says, I am he that liveth and was dead. Yes. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Yes. Amen. Yes. And have the keys of hell and of yes. death. He took on flesh and he died as a man. Yep. So that he could rise again once yes. and for all. So all of mankind, whosoever believes on him, shall have life. Yes. Yes. And life yes. eternal. Yes. And be free from the fear of death forevermore. Right. Right. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 in the message. Since the children are made of flesh and blood, it's logical that the Savior took on flesh and blood yep. in order to receive I'm sorry, in order to rescue them from his death. Yep. By embracing death, taking it into himself, he destroyed the devil's yes. hold on death and freed all who cower throughout yes. life, scared to death of yep. death. Yes. John, thir- John, John 3, 16. Yep. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever shall believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Oh, they didn't understand. <clears throat> but for days, the disciples didn't understand. They went to the tomb, and they just saw death. <clears throat> Excuse me. They mourned. They wept. So much so that even when Jesus rose again, they didn't even recognize him. Mark 16. <clears throat> I'm going to read it from the message again. The resurrection. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so they could embalm him. Very early on Sunday morning, as the sun rose, they went to the tomb. They worried out loud to each other, who will roll back the stone from the tomb for us? Then they looked up, and they saw that it had been rolled back. It was a huge stone, and walked right in. They saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed all in white, and they were completely taken aback. They were astonished. He said, don't be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus the Nazarene, the one who was nailed to the cross. He's been raised up and he's no longer here. You can see for yourselves the place is empty. Yeah. Now, on your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going on ahead of you to Galilee. You'll see him there exactly as he said. Yeah. They got out as fast as they could beside themselves. Their heads swimming, stunned. They said nothing to anyone. After rising from the dead, Jesus appeared early on Sunday morning to Mary Magdalene, whom he had delivered from seven demons. She went to his former companions, now weeping and carrying on, and told them. And when they heard her report that she had seen him alive and well, they didn't believe her. Later, he, he appeared, but in a different form, to two of them out walking in the countryside. They went back and told the rest, but they weren't believed either. Twice he appeared, and they didn't believe. Still later... At the 11, as the eleven were eating supper, he appeared and took them to task most severely for their stubborn unbelief, refusing to believe those who had seen him raised up. Then he said, go into the world, go everywhere and announce the message of good news to one and all. Whoever believes and is baptized is saved. Whoever refuses to believe is damned. There are some of the signs that will accompany believers. They will throw out demons in my name. They will speak in new tongues. They will, they will take snakes in their hands. They will drink poison and not be hurt. They will lay hands on the sick and make them well. And then the master Jesus, after briefing them, was taken up to heaven, and he sat down beside God in the place of honor. And the disciples went everywhere preaching, the master working right with them, validating the message with undisputable evidence. Not only 
Did they not believe when others told them of his resurrection? They didn't even recognize Jesus himself when he appeared. There's something about resurrection that doesn't look like it did before. We may not recognize it. How do we recognize it? And especially Doubting Thomas, right? We know about Doubting Thomas. In John 20, it says, One of the twelve wasn't present when Jesus appeared to them. It was Thomas, whose nickname was the twin. So the disciples informed him, We have seen the Lord with our eyes, with our own eyes. And still unconvinced, Thomas replied, There's no way I'm going to believe this unless I personally see the wounds of the nails in his hands and touch them with my fingers and put my hand into the wounds in his side that was pierced. And then eight days later, Thomas and all the others were in the house together. And even though all the doors were locked, Jesus suddenly stood before them. Peace to you, he said. And then looking into Thomas's eyes, he said, put your finger here in the wounds of my hand. Here, put your hand in my wounded side and see for yourself. Thomas didn't give in to doubts. Don't give in to your doubts any longer. Just believe. When the words spilled out of his heart, you are my Lord and you are my God. And Jesus responded, Thomas, now that you've seen me, you believe. That there are those who have never seen me with their eyes, but have believed in me with their hearts. Mm-hmm. And they will be blessed even more. Yes. Jesus. Yes. Church, we are called to just believe. Yes. Yes. We need to put, do we need to put our finger in his side? Do we need to see Jesus walk through walls? Do we need to see that or do we just believe? You see, here's the problem. This is why I think the disciples didn't recognize resurrection. It wasn't that they didn't know who Jesus was. They knew who he was. They gave up everything to follow him. They lived and served with him for three years, day in and day day out. They knew how wonderful and how full of grace and mercy he was. Mm -hmm. But they didn't know who they were. Mm -hmm. They didn't understand who they were. They didn't know that they were chosen to carry it on, that he had passed the torch to them. Yes. They, didn't, they weren't looking. They were sitting back. Woe is me. My Savior's yeah. gone. We, we were followers of him. We don't know how to be leaders. Yeah. They were called to be leaders of a new generation, a new creation. Yes. They were called to be the ones that led the way, that blazed the trail. Yes. And they were looking for a leader, and they were lost. Right. They were lost without their leader. They didn't, they didn't know who they were. Right. They didn't understand the work that Jesus did, that Jesus wouldn't be with them forever, that he wasn't going to tell them every step of the way. He wasn't going to say, go here, go there. He wasn't going to say, pray for them, go there. He was going to say, go forth. Go forth. And then it was up to them to carry on the Father's work. They didn't understand that as Jesus was in this world, so are we. 1 John 4, 15 through 19. 1 John 4, 15 through 19. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. How does our love be made perfect? Our love is made perfect, that we may have boldness. Boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. The only judgment comes against the things that are not of God. Satan, sickness, disease, that is the judgment. We are to have boldness and judgment against the things that are not of God. Anything that is contrary to the word of God. We are to judge and condemn and be bold. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear has torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Yes. And um, the message Bible says God is love. When we take up permanent residence in a life of love, we live in God and God lives in us. This way, love has the run of the house, becomes at home, and matures in us so that we're free from worry on Judgment Day. Our standing in the world is identical to Christ. There is no room for love and fear. Well-formed love banishes fear. I'm so thankful that Nathan is teaching us Sunday after Sunday about all that we are in Christ Jesus. When we understand who we are in Christ, it makes it easy for us to do our part to make it through the ups and downs of this life. 
uh, to speak his word, right? That's what he talked about, to speak his word. And back in John it says, but if you make yourselves at home with me and my words are at home in you, mm -hmm. you can be sure that whatever you ask will be listened to yes. and acted upon. Yes. We have to be at home in the word. Yes. We have to build our home to hang out, to chew on it, to surround yes. ourselves with the Jesus. word, to speak it, and to put that, mm, yep. the word, that is how it is acted upon. Yes. To wait upon him. To make yourselves at home in my love. Yes. To make yourselves at home in my love. If you keep my commands, yes. you will remain intimately at home in my love. And what is yes. his command? Yes. To love yes. one another. Yes. Matthew 22, 36 through 40. To make yourselves at home in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain intimately at home in my love. Yes. And Matthew 22, 36 through 40. Master, which is the greatest commandment of the law? They're trying to trick him, right? They're trying to trick him. Which is the greatest commandment? Yep. Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Mm -hmm. On these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. Mm -hmm. Just love. Guys, sometimes it's not easy to love. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it takes everything in us to choose to love. Mm -hmm. Not everybody deserves love. Mm -hmm. But we are called to love. Yeah. To thank him and to praise him until it does come to pass. Mm -hmm. To wait upon him, right? The waiting. The waiting is only possible if we will abide in that love. Right. Because if we're busy loving, then the time just passes. Yes. The waiting doesn't seem like such a burden. Right. When we choose to love him and worship, yes. the time just doesn't even matter. Time falls away. Right. We choose to love one another. We're so busy being about the Father's work that he's working, and it'll just happen. It'll just right. come to pass before we know it. And to trust in him, knowing with our whole heart that God is good yes. and that he is faithful to the end. Yep. Jesus, in, back in John 15, he told the disciples, I've told you these things for a purpose. You have a purpose. Jesus has a purpose for you. Yes. That my joy might be your joy yes. and your joy wholly mature. The trusting in him, the waiting in him brings a maturity to our joy. And that this is my command, love one another the way I have loved you. Trusting him is trusting that people won't, that our love is not our own and that his love cannot be abused. Right. His love cannot be it's not about us. No. It's not about us. No. When we choose to give God's love to people right. who don't deserve it, whatever, we, who are we to judge who deserves right. it? Did we deserve it when God gave his love to us? No. Just love. Yeah. And um, so remember, every day, through the good and the bad, yes. to let go and let God. Yes. Yes. The, God <laughs> Amen. the Holy Ghost, the great friend, the comforter, he will come. Yes. And he will bring life. And it may not look like what we thought. It may not look like what we started out is. But when we let go and we let God, we say that every Sunday. Yeah. When we just will trust him, we yeah. speak his word, yeah. we wait upon him, yeah. and we trust him, yeah. and we just let it all go, yeah. we will make a way. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's what he's talking about. Yes. Trusting him. Yes. Amen. Amen. That's all I have this morning. Anybody have anything they want to share before we wrap up? I'm done really early. <laughs> it's time for brunch. All right. Well, praise the Lord. Thank you, everybody. Be blessed. Have a great week. Be blessed.